Provincial Secretary James Logan moved his household to Stenton in 1730. The house served as the family's primary residence until his death in 1751, which is a key moment for thinking about um, the yellow lodging room as we restored it. After which time, the house descended in the family to eldest sons for four generations, and after a 40-year period of neglect, it opened as a historic site administered by the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America in Pennsylvania in 1899. So I'm just gonna start off with a couple of slides from um, our collection on the right and um, a, a city collection, but kept at the Philadelphia Museum of Art to show the family's engagement with textiles. These are the two daughters and examples of their needlework showing um, both their education and the access that families like the Logans had to imported goods coming through from, um, from England. And I really wish we had James Logan's 1730s ledger book because that probably captured the actual furnishing of this room, but we do not have access to that. So if anyone knows anyone descended from any Logans, you know, it could still be under somebody's bed. Um, but this, this 1720s ledger book also just gives us snapshots um, also of engagement with textiles. And I have just called out some things like to make curtains, um, upholstery for stools, a note on the furniture, and many of you may already know that hangings for a bedstead and a, and a room window curtains were known as the furnishings or the furniture for, for the bedstead. Notes about weaving, purchase of a suite of curtains, a quilt, etc., plush for a couch, um, and notations about uh, blankets in here. So the room in question is at the top of um, this, the second floor stair landing as you come up entering the house through double wide doors with double wide doors breaking off in all directions. Um, for formal entertaining, the house is clearly designed for ascent to the second floor with a double wide stair where there's another pair or seeming pair of double doors um, and this one to the yellow lodging room lines up with the stair and there you get a sense for how it fits into the plan in relationship to the staircase. So 17, Logan's death in 1751-52 is um, key to thinking about a, a snapshot for the room because we do have copies of the probate inventory taken after his death. Um, and this is actually a 1950s sort of photograph when the colonial dames did become aware that this existed and, and to some degree looked to it, although um, the actual surviving document is missing from the city archives. But the room had a yellow worsted damask bed with curtains, window curtains, and bedclothes, et cetera, of 30 pounds. This, this became a focus of my my research questions, 12 maple chairs with worsted damask bottoms, so a full suite um, to match the room, the chimney furniture, one maple chest of drawers and table, and Stenton had received by bequest in 2001 um, from Pamela DuPont Copeland, James Logan's actual maple high chest and dressing table, which had been in the room. Um, sconce glasses and a tea table and a broken set of china and since all of our ceramics are archaeological the broken set works really well for us. This all totaled over 66 pounds and I should add this was the only room on that probate inventory that had window curtains. So going back to the 1970s, sort of our before slide in our, you know, if this is HGTV, we're starting out here. Um, and this is the first iteration of the yellow lodging room that the Colonial Dames restored in the 1970s after uh, Winterthur graduate Ray Shepard had done a 1968 thesis on Stenton and I think probably helped them with some of this work. Um, but they did these floor-to-ceiling lined, watered wool, ready-made um, hangings and they had, had this made for a federal period bedstead in the collection at George Lampus's interior decorating workshop in Chestnut Hill. And it, 
for those of you who have been to Stenton, you might sort of recognize this is not a backwards slide. This postcard captures the, um, the room that we now show as the blue lodging room. They changed the location for this before number two, which is about how, um, just be, when I arrived at Stenton before the high chest and dressing table did, um, <clears throat> but this is how it looked in the early years that I worked there. And I'm calling out at the top here, the hooks in the ceiling that became um, the subject of my curiosity and the fact that this 1975 suite of, of reproduction textiles was made for the other room, which only had four windows, meant that there, this room that had five windows, there, wasn't, there weren't enough curtains. And when I did arrive at Stenton, the bedstead was sitting on this pier. Um, and I was getting curious about the hooks and I said to my furnishings committee, I'd really like to move the bedstead under the hooks. And this was actually quite controversial because why would you put a bed in front of a window? That's really odd. So indeed, um, we overcame this and I just, well, let's just move it, you know, we can always move it back. Let's see how this feels. And indeed, it does bring a sense of um, feeling that the, the bed is in the right place in the room. So I got a bit obsessed with hooks in ceilings in bed chambers, and again, I ask if you know any houses that have hooks in ceilings. I'm, I, keep, I keep a running record. Um, New Jersey, Bartram's Garden, um, here in, the, in Cecil County, Maryland. And then the other way that you can also get a bedstead with its tester or the frame that supports the, um, the bed hangings close to the ceiling is to literally build it into the ceiling, like this period room in the Baltimore Museum of Art and these couple of cornices that I have photos of, courtesy of um, Ralph Harvard. So I really, again, started to get quite piqued about this when um, Country Life published this um, bedstead that survived in the collections of English heritage, but with these new um, crimson heritine furnishings designed by Annabelle Westman in the Handel House in London. And this is now the Handel and Hendrix House, if you um, go to see this museum. This, this installation, you can just see the hook here, did not have original hooks. They added them for this. But note also that there's just a plain curtain rod, no valance, um, but floor, floor length curtains. And of course, I was inspired by um, state bed chambers. Here's one of Daniel Marot's designs. But in thinking about how a room like the Yellow Lodging Room functioned as an important entertaining space where the wealth in terms of um, the Worcester Damask textiles was on view in the room with the full um, set of chairs. And um, I had the pleasure of going on as a scholar um, the Addingham Summer School in 2007, and this again took on greater life, and I became quite obsessed with state bedsteads on that visit. Um, but seeing the Up Ark Dolls House, and notice this blue one here, I have a detail of that bedstead um, shortly. And um, one of Annabelle Westman's photographs from her recent book, um, The Art of Trimmings, here showing the lace. And I just wanted to point out the interior ceiling that she shows. There's a cornice, and he, in this case, a, a decorative um, ceiling, and all the seams being covered with what was then called lace, or we might call trim. But here in the Up Ark dollhouse, you can see the actual little hooks, which was a great thrill. So I also looked to documentary sources, and one that was very helpful is um, William Stukeley's watercolor of his own bedchamber, and just about the time that Stenton was finished. And I even used his drawing of his bedstead to look at, to create some of the proportions that we actually built in terms of height off the floor, and noting that the cornice in the room and the cornice of the bedstead aligned, the depth of the valance. And I assume all these little stripes and um, outlines really are outlines of lace. And I knew about a cornice that survived. My graduate school professor, Gail Kasky winkler at Penn pointed out to me um, that she knew this early cornice at Walnford in Monmouth County, New Jersey, that she thought didn't have anything to do with the bedstead that it was resting on. And so I went out with um, David DiMuzio from the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and we 
um, verified that we did think it was older than the bedstead there, and measured it and photographed it so that I could ultimately draw it, and then Mike Podmaninsky could build a copy for me. So that really became our starting point as far as a physical document. And looking at the cornice um, at Mon uh, in Monmouth County and the Handle House bed, Mike and I together designed um, the parts. And he really made this all work. Uh, he used tulip poplar and built this reproduction bedstead for us. These are some of the parts as we are laying them out on the floor, the legs the cornice, the backboards, the, the bed rails, um, and we would ultimately add um, an inner cornice, as you see here, and then an edge that you'll see toward the end of the presentation. Um, the dames insisted we have a real engineer, oops, come on site to be sure that these original hooks were going to hold the weight, and indeed, um, they could each hold 50 pounds, and we were well below that in our final product. So the next big question was, okay, yellow worsted damask. What is the damask pattern that we want for this time period? And again, I feel I was quite lucky in that this Arthur Davis um, portrait of Lady Juliana Penn has a wonderful damask pattern on the wall. This is in the collection at PMA, and PMA, Philadelphia Museum of Art, had already commissioned, um, Alexandra Kirtley did this, and commissioned this reproduction damask from Context Weavers in the UK. And they were both still alive at the time and weaving, and we ordered 177 yards of what's undyed, and it's called the gray goods. So then what is yellow? What does yellow mean? This became a big question that I pondered for a long time, and I went back to my friends at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where they have a settee that came down in the um, James Logan's daughter's line, Hannah Logan Smith, and um, they had reupholstered it in 1978 in this ready-made brunch wig um, yellow because they had actually there found um, yellow wool, reddish gold in hue on the piece. That we couldn't analyze it because it's probably still on the piece, but that was an important piece of information. And then I commissioned Richard Newman at the MFA in Boston to dianalyze this quilt in our collection, um, which turned out to have an indigo face. And after much trying, he identified the, the rear yellow side as a, a dye called Old Fustic. And old fustic comes from a South American um, mulberry tree, the Macloria tinctoria, and makes um, a yellow dye that can have a range of colors from gold to khaki, known to have a peachy or reddish hue. So I'm thinking, okay, this is matching up with um, what we found out at the Met. And meanwhile, paint analysis is going on, and this is um, the actual back side of one of the shutters in the room taken to its original surface. And I went to Winter Tour and checked out the Norwich Dyer's Swatch Books, which are from later in the century. But there were a number of things kind of in the range that were reminiscent of our quilt and our paint. And thinking about how these colors also match with the figured maple, this honey-colored furniture that's in the room. And suddenly, this idea of a picture that the color is so central to what's going on was beginning to emerge. One of the things that remains a bit of a curiosity for me is the fact that the chairs are so expensive and it doesn't seem to be accountable that you can account for it in the textiles um, because they're, they're only upholstered on the bottoms. It's very specific that these are not back stools with upholstery. Um, and I still wonder, I haven't been able to make a connection, but whether something with an updated claw and ball foot could change the price enough that perhaps... Um, a model such as that in the maple bedroom at um, Winterchur was actually the type of chair. But we are really pleased now to own six maple chairs with slip seats that we do have in the room, and we're just able to complete um, that by purchasing four at the Paff and Ross sale in 2022. So turning to continued questions of, of paint and curtains, um, this is the 1985 paint scheme with brown uh, window 
sills and window seats and black baseboards. And just notice that the, these are those 1970s floor length curtains and how sort of bunched up it all is with the high chest next to it. And I, paint could be a whole separate talk and my colleague who did the paint analysis gives it way better than I do. So I'm just gonna show you one um, slide here that's all technical. These are the plant cells and these are the yellow layers that she found in the room. And we asked a series of questions, but one, um, one that was quite key was about the window seats on either side of that maple high chest, which are cut off square. And I wanted to know if that had been done early in the evolution of the room, which she determined it had. The other key question she answered for me was that window situation behind the bedstead. Um, and she determined that that window was not repainted the second time that the room was painted, indicating that something continued to block the window for two generations. So that was awfully nice as well. And there's, there's Kathy My Cassie Myers, and um, the paint is this ochre, yellow ochre, with little um, flakes of red ochre or iron oxide, bound with linseed oil and bulked and tinted with white lead. And I'll come back to um, lead in a bit as well. So it was, what was so exciting was she found there were not picked out um, baseboards and chair rails, but all the wood surfaces in the room were the same yellow, which has really changed, you wouldn't necessarily think so, really changed the feeling of the room to have yellow on all the surfaces. And lo and behold, Lady Penn does too, so that was awfully nice. And there's lots of toing and froing between Cassie and me about um, paint, textile, dye, and various pigments that she was researching and, and getting from different parts of the world to compare. And we made a big spring decision um, to go above our, our, bu our planned budget and go into our Stenton Restoration Fund so that we could do a paint that was mixed on site and a custom made paint. Um, and here you see the, um, the room as it's being prepared. The 1980s paint was sealed with shellac, so it would be very easy to go back to this layer if we wanted to and um, the walls had been repaired and whitewashed at this stage. And then primed, and this is Erica Sanchez Goodwillie on the right who worked with Chris Mills to do this wonderful paint job for us, and the finished ochre paint. Now, um, it was really glossy here when we took these pictures in 2017. It did not dry, or sort of dry, until 2019, and so I would not recommend you try this at home. Um, <laughs> It is, um, because we did not use lead and we used titanium, um, one of the other dr alternative dryers you can use is chalk. And Cassie really didn't want to add chalk because of the way it would change the color. Um, but in a humid climate like Philadelphia's, this paint can still even become ever so slightly tacky in the summer. Turning to the trim, um, I also had to you know, I'd run up the budget on the paint. We were spending more money than we planned to. And um, I was working with Rabbit Goody at Thistle Hill Weavers, and uh, what I wanted to, to get for the trim was also gonna be more than I had planned. Um, and so I'm working with the committee, and they're saying things to me like, but they were Quakers, would they really have trim? And I said, yes, they would. And turned to Florence Montgomery to help me out in my argument, where she included this quote, but the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting of Women Friends in 1698 warned that no superfluous furniture be in your houses as great fringes about your valances and double valances and double curtains and many such like needless things which the truth maketh manifest to the humble-minded. So I really liked this quote because it's, it's, early, it's actually in the 17th century, but it's indicating that... Um, that women make some of these furnishing decisions, even though men's account books tend to, to hold the information. Um, and it also says that everyone's being reprimanded because they're already doing it and they're making their red chambers with lots of superfluous things. So I thought a little um, tape was absolutely necessary. And here you see what we chose and then turning back to Logan's 1720s ledger book where we could see he actually had um, an account in which he, he sold um, laces uh, and so forth. 
So turning then to what color that trim should be, um, I, I went back to my friend, the Up Park Dolls House, and the yellow with the red trim, and here a more red damask, red and gold damask with gold trim, and just noticing in general how many state bedchambers were combinations of gold and red in one scheme or another. And here Rabbit Goody already made a diamond pattern that was quite similar to this tape that you see kind of in the middle of, um, on this Peabody Essex Museum valance. And looking at how I would design the valances, I decided I didn't want to copy a surviving one. They're all from New England that I could easily um, look to, which I find to be interesting that more survive there. Um, but if I, if I chose one with a different um, profile, it wouldn't necessarily speak to the curves on and bumps on the cornice I was working with. So I looked to these for a general sense of profile. And there's the back of that Peabody Essex one. And put, designed something that would be in conversation with the cornice we had copied. So looking at where it um, changed its shape and undulated and thinking about the back of the Logan settee and ultimately looking to our own um, furniture in the room for some of the inspiration. Our archeological um, collection provided the measurements for the curtains, or curtain rings, rather. And I also was, again, thinking about whether I needed valances or not, and seeing that even you know, an elegant room at Wanstead did not have valances was further justification for me. Um, this painting now, you may have just read about, has a cupid in it. Um, and I commissioned local blacksmith Luke de Berardinus to do our rods and rings, um, and he made this compass rod for the cornice, um, which he made in two halves that met at a bracket in the center. And these are the rods as they sit in the, the fascia board above the windows. And they stick out just enough that these shutters, because they don't sit um, in line with the wall, they stand front of the wall when um, open, that there's room for that. Here's that cut um, window seat. And I decided that this was partly evidence for not only the fact that the maple high chest really sat here and that they probably cared to cut it because you could glimpse the curve of the back leg, um, but this was also a justification for thinking about ending the curtains at the window seats. And then when I went to measure, to my delight, the windows were 100 inches high to the window seat and 50 inches wide, and that was an awfully nice proportion. Um, and then this is just an example of where I learned the hard way that wool is hygroscopic and it grows when it's humid. And so I was really glad we made these curtains rather slowly because we made the first pair in May and by August they had grown well below the window seat and I was able to move them to a window that actually is an inch longer. So there's a constant dance in the room with the textiles. Um, and we, were, we had lost quite a bit to our, our finishing. We chose to do moth proofing for this fabric too, which was a bit controversial. Um, there's some um, understanding that off-gassing can, can you know, just affect um, other surfaces in the room, but we were spending so much money that I really, I decided given what's going on with climate that I wanted to moth proof this um, textile. So we shellacked all the bed parts. Um, and then here is in Beth Paolini's studio. She's laying out the design on the components with hide glue and finishing the edges with the lace and was very careful about the symmetry of the designs on the, on the panels and cornice. And you can see um, that work here. And then this is the day that we actually assembled the bedstead. And I was really grateful that I know a lot of very tall men. <laughs> And here they are hoisting the cornice up using a, sort of like a, the hooks as pulleys and laying our ceiling, which was really just very simple. We did not do an elaborate ceiling and that helped reduce the weight um, inside that cornice. And there's Mike Podmaninsky tying it off. So you can see that the, the cornice aligns with the room's cornice and the, you can see the rods here, the, the way the curtain rods sit at the top of the fascia in the room, and Beth at work, tacking all these um, balances and things on. 
And so the, some of the, the tape that was glued down was woven selvage to selvage. But to save money, um, Rabbit also wove some of the, the trim so that it was five across and could be cut, up, cut apart. And then Beth used that to edge all of the curtains, both bed and window curtains. And another remaining question outstanding was, oh goodness, how far apart should we put the rings? And um, of course, I sent an email to Linda Eaton at Winterture, and hours later, um, I had an answer with photos of um, an example that had pewter rings that were six inches apart, and one of their um, yellow bed hangings collections that had rings three inches apart, and so I decided to go with four. <laughs> Um, and the way these are, you can see here how we um, wrapped the tape around the rings to, um, again, following historic patterns, and that we made the curtains with um, what's known as a flat felled seam. That's like the seam down the side of your blue jeans. So when the light comes through, you do have these lines that are define part of the design. There's Beth making the sacking bottom for the bedstead, and... Um, when we came, we sort of worked the whole thing. Cornice was the first thing, kind of a top to bottom in sequence. And as we got to the bottom, I decided I wanted the um, foot valances to have feet. And so we designed that. And it took us several tries to be happy with the rear inside valance. And we ultimately went with a sort of central drop um, inspired by the maple high chest in the room. We were able to reuse um, a cotton mattress and then created a poly-filled tick for the top. And lo and behold, that spring of 2017, I was going to be teaching um, some Penn students at Paldrum Castle in, um, in the west of England, and I had a chance to go back and actually look at the Handel House bed. And I realized one of the things we didn't pick up on in any of the photos we worked from was a nice... Um, you know, piece of mold, upholstered molding to finish off the bedstead, and I really wanted that. And fortunately, we had enough fabric that Mike could go back and make those for me. Here he is cutting off the legs, and there is Beth um, putting in some of the very last stitches on those foot valances. There she is admiring her work, and uh, we had put the Logan family indigo quilt on its best phase face in the room, and you get a sense for how the room fundamentally looks much of the time um, in natural light, this sort of golden khaki hue of all of this. And when you invite a photographer and modern lights, um, it probably never really quite looked like this, this bright in the 18th century, but these were the sort of portraits we took um, to mark the project. And since this completion, oops, actually, we um, received by bequest this portrait of Sarah Logan Norris, which we've placed in the room and really brings into focus the notion of women and textiles. And this is a, a space for female soci sociability um, and her snuff box, too, which came to the collection just last summer. So this is after, um, sort of formally speaking. And um, just color mattered in the 18th century in, in decoration. And due to the cost of dyes, there was a hierarchy of color. More though than I expected, the harmony of tones in Stenton's Yellow Lodging Room presented itself through the paint and dye analysis. The conjunction of tones, uh, gold with a reddish hue, convinced me that for those who could afford to achieve it, a harmonious scheme mattered. The room also got me thinking about maple and its use in furniture in this period as an American taste, and Stetton's yellow lodging room as an antecedent of the ever-popular maple bedrooms of many 20th century collectors, including Henry Francis DuPont at Winterthur and Pamela DuPont Copeland of Mount Cuba, who bequeathed her pieces to Stenton. Not only is the maple furniture American, but if indeed the Logans used this glazed wool tammy quilt um, in the room with its best indigo face forward, it features American sunflowers. Was there a particular colonial American taste expressed in Stenton's best bedchamber? We did not do anything to this room that is not reversible. 
While Stenton continues to have a philosophy of adding paint layers, because of the shellac, we could very easily go back to the, the most recent layer, previous recent layer. And I hope that the refurbishment of this room will last for 35 to 50 years, after which time new research will further refine the presentation for the next time around. Stanton is always evolving, always refining its presentation of the past, collecting more Logan family objects, and continually complicating the history we tell to offer as complete a window on history as possible. Often, the jewel box buildings of the past become historic house museums. They offer us beauty, objects in context, and a responsibility to share and wrestle with the social structures of the past that shape our present today. Historic places can inspire us to a better future. And I just have to say thanks to our funders, especially Hannah Henderson, who's pictured here. Um, and she's the one who made all the difference in being able to use the more expensive trim. And I, I, had, I don't know if she knew or not, but she came to the meeting to decide this dressed in the same color as the room. And it took quite a team of advisors and craftspeople over many years um, to make this happen. It takes a village to raise a bedstead. <laughs> so thank you all very much for your kind attention this morning. If you're interested in seeing more pictures from the process, you can go to Stenton's web website. There's a yellow room tab, and there is this little time-lapse, um, nearly five-minute video of our assembly of the space. So I hope you all have um, a wonderful rest of your stay, and thanks again. <laughs>